I'm Gloria Groom, the Chair of European Painting and Sculpture and the David and Mary Winton Green Curator, and it is, I'm thrilled to have you all joining us tonight for a discussion on Artists on Cézanne. Tonight we have the pleasure of hearing from artists Rodney McMillian, Julia Fish, and co-curator of the exhibition, Caitlin Haskell, in a conversation around Cézanne's work. But before I introduce our esteemed panelists, I thought it would be good to back up a little bit and offer a few words about our goals for the exhibition, which were so aligned to tonight's program. Four years ago, when Caitlin and I were pre-COVID, talking about the scope of the exhibition with the curators at the Tate Modern, our ambition was not only to present a career-wide exhibition across genre, across media, but also to build upon the opinions that were expressed about Cezanne during and after his lifetime by Monet, by Pissarro, by Matisse, by Picasso, all of whom considered Cezanne is the greatest of us all, or as Picasso said, the, found, the father of us all. The us that they were referring to was very much artists. And Caitlin and I felt it was time that we explored further why Cezanne, who was, as you know, generally unsuccessful um, in selling his art and having people like his art except for a few collectors, why was he such an important touchstone to artists then and now? So tonight, I have the privilege of introducing two of the, oh, I don't have a, I don't have a clicky thing. Well, um, okay, whatever. Two artists who have contributed, we've asked to contribute to the Cezanne project, not only in the catalog, as you would have seen if I could change the slide, but also in the exhibition itself alongside selected works. Both artists have an intimate association with the Art Institute, and both artists have works on view in the modern wing, second floor, please go up there sometime. Um, and the will start with Rodney McMillian, a native of Columbia, South Carolina, and for the past 22 years, a Los Angeles-based artist working with sculpture, installation, painting, video, and performance. Rodney has had solo exhibitions at numerous museums and galleries in both the U.S. and Europe, and his works are part of the permanent collection, in addition to the Art Institute at UCLA, Hammer Museum, and Museum of Contemporary Art, Los Angeles. And this fall, he will have works here, again, in the Stone Gallery in the Modern Wing. Julia Fish is also near and dear to our city as a professor emerita at the University of Illinois in Chicago. She's the recipient of numerous grants and awards. Her practice engages both site and context in, in temporary public installations, as well as sustained sequence of paintings and works on paper that she has developed in reference to the architecture of her home and studio. Julia's paintings were presented in the 2010 Whitney Biennial, and her more than two dozen solo exhibitions include DePaul Art Museum's recent 10-year survey. Thirdly, and not lastly, I'm happy to welcome, as panel moderator, my dear friend, colleague, Caitlin Haskell, the Gary C. and Francis Comer Curator in Modern and Contemporary Art and Director of the Ray Johnson Collections and Research, and as mentioned before, my co-curator in crime. Part of the Art Institute family since 2018, Caitlin is a scholar of 20th century painting and sculpture whose exhibitions and publications have addressed the production and critical reception of modern art in Europe and the Americas. And now, I'm going to let Caitlin take it over. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much, Gloria, for that warm introduction and welcome. And good evening to all of you in the audience. It's wonderful to see so many people here. Yeah, that's OK, Rodney. Um, for our artist conversation um, on Cezanne. And it's been wonderful preparing for this conversation with both of you. And I really look forward to exploring a theme that has really been a through line of this exhibition, as Gloria was saying, from the very beginning. So um, when we started thinking about this show four years ago, there were three types of voices that we wanted to foreground in the exhibition. And those were the usual voices of, of curators, but also conservators and artists. 
And one of the reasons that we wanted to do that was because Cezanne has been known, kind of colloquially, as an artist's artist. Um, what does that mean, an artist's artist? If, you know, in the course of giving an exhibition tour, I'm asked that question, I typically say, well, the most important audience for Cezanne's work during his lifetime was fellow artists. And there are a few places in the exhibition where we can make that point really well. For example, um, in this pair of, of works, the, the Still Life with Fruitish by Cezanne, and then the painting by uh, Paul Gauguin, really an homage to Cezanne, where he um, depicts, where basically where he describes a painting by Cezanne that was in his own collection. Um, but that's really just one way to answer the question of, why Cezanne is an artist's artist. As you're going through the exhibition, you'll also see um, works of Cezanne that were owned by fellow members um, of the Impressionist circle. So you'll see here paintings that were owned by Monet, Pizarro, Cayabat, Degas, and Gauguin. And then in the 20th and 21st century, we also have, again, works that were owned by Picasso, Matisse, Henry Moore and Jasper Johns was also a very generous lender to the exhibition, also paintings owned by Lucian Freud. Um, and in the, the introduction to the exhibition catalog, you know, we talk about folks like Paula Motorson Becker, you know, who writes about Cezanne in 1907 and says, he was one of the three or four powerful artists who affected me like a thunderstorm. And we thought, what are the effects that Cezanne is having today? Um, what are the ideas that he brings to mind um, of practicing artists? And so we invited um, 10 current makers to select a work in the exhibition and really to help us see them um, as, as a painter sees, as an artist sees. Uh, and those have gone in wonderfully creative and critical directions um, with responses of poetry, um, some letter writing, um, and institutional critique, and really wonderful responses to this group of pictures. Today, we're going to be focusing uh, on the works that Rodney wrote about and that Julia wrote about. Um, Rodney wrote a, a beautiful piece on Soubois from 1894, the very first work that you see um, when you go into the exhibition. And Julia wrote about um, the, th the Three Skulls, uh, actually from the Art Institute's own collection. Um, but before we hand it over to them, I just thought we would talk about a, a couple of aspects of Cezanne's work that, that maybe make him distinct from other artists of his generation um, and, and might contribute to this um, impression of him being an artist's artist. So um, what we see here are, are works that are really bookending Cezanne's career, the panoramic view of Auvers from around 1873, and then another Soubois, um, painted around the, by the Chateau Noir in the south of France in the last years of Cezanne's life, around 1900. Cezanne dies in 1906. Um, neither of these works were exhibited by Cezanne in his lifetime. So people who saw these pictures would have been invited by him to do so. Um, neither work is signed. Um, if you look at them today, um, there might be aspects of them that could appear unfinished, and I'm saying that softly. We've had a lot of conversations about the, the appropriateness of that term, unfinished, but certainly in a 19th century context, um, if, you, if you look at the painting that's on the right, um, things that would be shocking, right, are the, the fact that there's a lot of bare canvas, that the marks are really large, amplified, relative to the overall scale of the picture, um, and you can really see the materiality of how Cezanne was working, right? So there's a sense of description and representation, but the materiality is just omnipresent. Um, and, you know, Julia, I'm gonna turn it over to you in a moment, um, but what we hoped was that artists would help us see these aspects of Cezanne's work that kind of make it still feel today a little bit like a studio visit, and then also bring new perspectives of how these paintings are, are circulating today. So, without further ado, Thanks. let's move to the skulls and Julia. The skulls. And Julia. <laughs> uh, that, wasn't an, that was not a macabre laugh. It was um, a sympathetic laugh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, good evening. Um, I have to begin by thanking Gloria and Caitlin for the invitation to be part of a, a rather long swim 
in Cezanne, I think Gloria and Caitlin have been lap swimming, and um, I think I've been kind of paddling around and coming in and out of the pool. Um, but I also want to thank uh, Kevin Salatino and uh, Jay Clark and Mary Broadway from Princeton Drawings. And they were extraordinary in giving me access to see this particular work in person on two occasions during the pandemic, and that meant phone calls and emails and arrangements beyond the beyond. Um, and then the extraordinary opportunity, which I had asked for and they were so kind to grant, um, to see it twice. Uh, some of you in the audience, some of you here know that I believe in the second look. So part of my understanding and agreement to, to, to write, to look and to write, was that I, I know that I don't trust myself on, on one go. And so that was uh, a special benefit to go to the lab, look at the work uh, with Jay and Mary, and um, make notes, go home, write, think, Try not to read too much about what other people had written about Cezanne because I had been uh, begged not to write a historical um, offering, but something that would reflect how I saw it. Uh, so I hope I accomplished that. Um, so what we're seeing is a watercolor that is unusually large for watercolors, and at the end of Cezanne's life, the watercolors became larger and larger. And as you can see, the um, open dates, uh, this work is not securely dated as a year, but is bracketed between 1902 and 06. Am I right? Yeah, yeah. that's right. Um, and what I saw was this transparent, um, almost evaporating image. And my process was to make notes and um, write and then make more notes after the second visit. And um, some of those words uh, I thought could be useful just to, to list past. An agitated wavering, the three were gathered together as if a selfie. Um, <laughs> They, they were snugged up, they were wincing in the light, just like I'm wincing in this light. Um, I thought that Cezanne's marks were both deliberate, but maybe some of them were hesitant. Um, all of it is disclosed by unforgiving paper. And then there's the skulls themselves, and it wasn't until the second look that I realized the lower jaw was missing. There are no tongues. Um, and the scalloped edge of the skull is curiously mimicking or trying to settle into floral uh, patterns that are equally scalloped. So there was a wonderful dialogue there for me. Uh, I, Would I you forgot, like to advance, or? I forgot to advance. Well, I was doing it for you. But, oh. there. but thank you. Um, so, so that was then. That was 2020 and 2021. And then we have this remarkable opportunity to see this work in the context of so much other work in what is, for me, a really difficult exhibition. This is not easy. Cezanne has not delivered us easy things to look at. And uh, the skulls are in the next to the last room. For those of you who have seen the exhibition, you, you realize you've come to them before being sort of washed by the bathers as in, in the last gallery. But what I wasn't quite prepared for was this juxtaposition, which is the watercolor that I had become so familiar with Set, set next to the painting uh, from Switzerland, from the uh, Solitern, and the sheer physicality 
of the oil painting as far away of a surface from the watercolor as one might find. As with this detail on the right, one from my own little iPhone, so no light control. But what we see there is a rugged evidence of him trying over and over and over to find that contour. And in that process, the skull becoming more and more physical. And in the dated years here, this says 1904, but the watercolors floating back and forth over that time, and in contrast to the physical edge, what we have in the watercolor. Let's see how many devices I can. <laughs> <laughs> What's astonishing to me still is that the contours that we see in the watercolor are open, broken lines. There's air that moves back and forth between the paper and the skull. And in contrast, we see this rugged, rugged. I mean, the skull might have been here for a while before it moved. Um, the transparency of the paper is the skull. And that, that became quite meaningful for me, that that became a kind of vaporous contemplation. So I was all the more stunned when, even though I'd seen images, slides of this painting that was coming from Switzerland, I wasn't prepared for the sort of knockout physical argument that happens between them. And I can only imagine Cezanne was going through that same argument. You can go forward. Let's see where we go. Oh, all right. We're in an exhibition with a lot of paintings and a group of stunning still lives, still life paintings, of which this is one. And because I've been fortunate to come back a few times since the exhibition opened, I've been able to become familiar with the things that Cezanne returned to over and over again, not unlike Mirandi, perhaps. Um, but it was only on Monday of this week, this is how slow looking really functions, is that only on Monday did I realize that the three um, objects hold the same position as the three skulls. And um, the, the st you know, I was, I was stunned by that. It was last week that I saw that the carpet tapestry was shared, and I thought that was, that was, um, that was deep enough for me then, a week ago. But on Monday, when I realized, oh my goodness, he placed the same objects in place of the still life forms that had been familiar to him. There was a different degree of contemplation. So here we see all three sort of in relationship to each other, the sort of the amount of light that's coming out of the plate in maybe a, com a comparable version of the kind of light that comes off the page. Um, and we have other examples of the skull, this sort of singular one on the right that um, I want to, you know, it's... Uh, the that's X coming through that the composition. X, yes, that's just almost too... Um, it's either too rugged or, I don't know, too goth. There's some, there's some 19th <laughs> century and 21st century something going on there, or tw late 20th century. Um, and then lastly, let me just say that this juxtaposition of the more, what do I want to say, studied um, scientific mm -hmm. examination of three skulls on a table um, is a quite different version of three um, than the, the th three clustered and protected and perhaps um, 
uh, yeah, snugged up. So they're snugged up. Yeah. Where are we here? There's, there's where we're walking away, and we're going to pass the baton to Rodney. And, you know, we didn't think of how appropriate it is that we're going from skulls to the bones underneath. Right. But, yes. uh, oh, thank yeah. you. And so it's, and this is, you know, we're going, <laughs> no, 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 no. no. I mean, that, that, title, that title has been with me, Rodney, the bones underneath. But I hadn't. We have, this is why we're here, right? To yes. make these connections. Yeah, and, catching it right now, too. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. Um, but yeah, so now we're going to go to the very first, the very first work in the exhibition, and I'll yeah. okay. take it away. Hi, everybody. I'm Roger McMillan. It's great to be here. Um, it's very special. Uh, having studied here, I mean, I've, yes. this is where I became an artist, where I decided to become an artist was here, actually, in Chicago at the school on August 28th, 1999. Uh, <laughs> because I got a scholarship to study in the post back program. And so um, it's quite special. And with this, and so thank you, Caitlin, and also Gloria, um, for um, inviting me to, to participate. And what it offered me, this um, opportunity to write, was to kind of re-walk through the halls of, of the Art Institute the way it was back in the late 90s, like in 98, 99, and 2000, um, where I learned how to paint. I would go through there. Uh, trying to figure out how to make certain colors. Like I'd never made gray before, so I'd go through the halls, the different er eras, and pick out different grays and try to paint them. And so when I was asked to write about Cezanne, it made me really think about like what my relationship to him was. And it actually is quite, it's not quite as involved. <laughs> 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 to be, um, what I discovered was in Susan Kraut's still life painting class was that I made a lot of paintings like, Chigo uh, like Cezanne, primarily because I didn't know what I was doing. He knew what he was doing in terms of like the, um, the breaking up of the picture frame and the apples falling down and, and, and um, the, the abstraction that he was, that he was uh, developing. Whereas that was just what I was doing because I hadn't quite, I hadn't, because I actually dropped out of Richard Rezac's uh, class, who I think is here, and had I actually stayed in there, I would have learned how to make perspectival <laughs> drawings and paintings. But, um, but in terms of like the choice of um, pictures to choose, I chose uh, Soupois because um, I, I love landscape paintings and I make landscape paintings and I'm really invested in the content that landscape painting offers. And, um, and in terms of this one, I really was um, taken by the title as well as what the painting is. And unlike Julia, I actually only saw it just today. Um, and um, because we did, we did think that you know you I being did, in Los I Angeles, did, I did, I did go to LACMA at one moment trying to like see it, but I forgot that they were under construction and that that <laughs> wing was closed. Um, <laughs> but in many regards, um, I think in, in many ways I respond to it the way that I respond to a lot of works, which is like I'm looking at the kind of conceptual threads, or at least what I'm thinking are the conceptual threads of it in the context in which it was made. And so I was really fascinated by. Um, um, by the fact that the horizon is actually the ground. I thought that was interesting in regards to the, um, the title of it, which one of the definitions is undergrowth. And so I was thinking about what is underneath um, this growth uh, of, of the landscape. It was also very different than like American um, river school painting um, that I was thinking of, that I've been looking at and kind of railing against because it doesn't offer this transcendent moment. You know, it's not like this, um, this God moment, or the sublime, this idea of like a propagandist kind of endeavor whereby it's like going west and like, you know, this is a chosen kind of land. I really appreciate the materiality of his work that is actually on the surface, that there's a real physicality to it um, that speaks to, um, uh, that speaks to a body um, that, that is temporal and that is contextual and that is representational and um, that is accountable. And so um, in, in writing about this, you know, so those are the things that drew me to this work. Um, but then alongside thinking about this work and like what his, um, I guess some of the ideas of his process, the materiality and, and the physicality and the, and the act of observation and, and, and the burgeoning, and the abstraction that he's, that he's developing, 
um, I was thinking about well, where it's located and how it's situated in the institution. And I was thinking about like what, like what are the choices that institutions make in terms of like what they choose to forefront? And in this case, um, at least as the institution was made when I was uh, a student, you know, you walk, you go through the patina lions and you go up the stairs and there's um, uh, the European wing where you saw a lot of the impressionist works and things like that. And, and, as I was a student, there were other things that I was drawn to. I was, there was a Horace Pippin painting that, that um, always blew my socks off. Should I go forward uh, to sure. that? Sure. And there, oh, I'm sorry. I, I okay. did, oh, oh, I, I skipped this part. Yeah. Oh, so this is the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, the beginning of the and, exhibition. And what's interesting too is um, we were talking earlier and Caitlin was talking about how she, you know, she wanted this beginning and thought about this beginning because it was all about uh, the sensation, the subjective position. And, I, and, and, if I've, and the thing that I really learned through this process and through talking to you all, it was, uh, uh, it was like, wow, he really, like, he really is like the godfather for the abstract expressionists in a certain way because uh, it was all about the subjective and it's also so much about him as a, myth a mythological kind of entity, mm -hmm. the kind of persona, the individualist. Yeah. Um, and, and so that was interesting to note. Um, can I say just please, one thing please, on that? Please, yeah, so, yeah, so I mean, this is maybe the most radical part of the exhibition in terms of how Gloria and I chose to lay out the show. Um, you know, we're beginning in 1894 with the painting uh, with the Subois. And what's very interesting about it, or a few things about it, um, just as a landscape, I mean, exactly what Rodney was saying. You know, if, if you're looking for something in a landscape, you want to have a clear horizon. Cezanne doesn't give that to you. We've got this X in the middle, and then kind of an explosion of color radiating out from it. And you don't really know where you're standing. I've thought at some points in time that he's looking forward, at other points in time that he's going up at the canopy. It kind of seems like an all over picture because the lines of the, the branches of the trees extend to the edges. But I mean, what you, what you talk about Rodney, is a, is, a, is a totally different set of references coming out of this. I mean, I, I think when I was, you know, saying, oh, it's, it's, it's radical because it's a landscape that doesn't function like a landscape and that really resists your gaze. It doesn't let you kind of look very deep into it. Um, brings you back to the surface, to, to materiality, which is exactly what you're saying. I mean, that, that this is part of the reason that materiality, that physicality, that sense of gesture that is still on the surface absolutely, you know, appeals to an Abex generation too. But you've kind of brought us to a, a different place through well, this juxtaposition with Pippin. Well, it, it's not so much a juxtaposition with Pippin, but more about the choices that an institution makes. makes. Right. And so what I was intrigued by was the fact that when you go up the stairs of, the, of this institution at that time, the European wing was the first thing you saw. Mm -hmm. And then this painting, which... Um, had a lot of import, at least for me, was in the American decorative wing, which was like way in the back research, like, I don't know where it was. It was somewhere kind of hidden on some side kind of like wall. And it's a question of context, because I, I was like, well, what kind of narratives are we, mm -hmm. are we uh, sharing in the American wings? And right. what is there and what is not there? And how are we looking? And what are we not seeing? And what are we, and then how are we seeing and understanding what we are encountering? Right. And so, um, it made me also think about Michael Asher, who in 1979 um, moved this uh, sculpture that's by Jean Anton um, Hodin that was originally outdoors, and he put it into one of the European wings of the museum. And so through that relocation from moving it from one place to the other, he's asking us to look at, well, what is the institution um, purporting with this statue out front, like why is it there and, and, and what is it suggesting about what we're gonna encounter once we come inside, but then what happens when it goes inside with its compatriots? How do we look at this thing aesthetically? Does it hold up to what's around it? And, and I think there's like bird shit still on it too. It's like the whole, <laughs> yeah, like right. all that it was is like Patina. right there. Yes. <laughs> and so like how do we understand what we're looking at when we move it from one location to the next? And so, those are the things that I thought about, um, oops, back up, back. Uh, 
when I encountered the Subois, and then when I thought about um, the kind of task that was that was asked, and um, and when I got to walk down memory lane and, and just to think about the choices that institutions make. Yeah, and what's what's interesting is that um, you know, as an art historian, I I tend to think that. Cezanne would be shocked that we were having a retrospective of his work. You know, this, this very sort of elevated position that he holds today really is from a generation of artists after him. You know, it's Yes, and I, I disagree with that. Yes. We, <laughs> I, think he, I think this is exactly yes. what he wanted. I think yes. he had the pose of the savage. I think, mm -hmm. he, I think he would love every minute of it. Yeah. I think well, it would eat it up. <laughs> yeah, and that's and that's really the 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 question I think in some ways is um, Cezanne in the ma in the manner in which he paints, there's a sense that he is unknowing centuries of tradition, and that he's stripping away illusionism, and that he's going back to something that he feels is subjective and and true in imparting his sensation and finding a technique that will allow him to do that, and I. I tend to, to believe that that's, um, that that's a search and a struggle and that it really was a very personal, um, I don't know, that it, that it was a, a personal project for, for him to find that language. And I think, you know, today it's like you see his name, you know, uh, on the facade of the building, Michigan Avenue, it looks like it, it, you know, it belongs there. But I think he would be very surprised by that. And I think that's that. actually precisely why he's such a good figure or was a good figure for the abstract expressionist yeah. because it was about the surface. It stripped out any kind of like content of like what was going on culturally, politically, mm -hmm. socially, you know, like Adrian right. Piper's The Logic of Modernism is a wonderful read right. that talks about like um, American painting at that time and like the, um, the, um, the challenges that artists from filmmakers or writers were having in terms of like the kind of censorship that was going on. And so the, the kind of like heroic individualist figure uh, that's all about the surface. He's like a wonderful, wonderful godfather for that. Mm -hmm. What some could argue. So, some, yes. I mean, I think I think that's a some very could suggest. <laughs> I, yeah. Which is which is interesting because I still tend to think about you know the ways that Pippin describes things, the, the very mm -hmm. rich material surface of that work, the way that there's kind of a a literalness in in describing. Tactile, tactilely, haptically, as opposed to sort of optically. And, and I think right. alongside that, that's where I think Cezanne's beautiful kind of description of what he does is like, I think eye of touch or painting of touch, where it's like this, yeah, the oh. haptic, yeah, where exactly. there's a real beautiful um, hand. And I think it's, not, it's nice to see them together. Yeah. And in fact, you can see them. There is one place right. where you can look at them now and see Cabin in the Cotton and Subois. But you've yeah. got to really kind of position yourself there in the, by the reinstalled oh. American gallery. So, Julia, I think you had a, a question also. Oh, well, actually, this is pretty good. Um, well, this is, this is, this is yeah, one of Rodney's pass. work right. so that is, is on view right now uh, in the modern wing. And um, we acquired this work um, in, in 2019 when we were just starting to think about the exhibition. And having seen this, I was like, gosh, I wonder if he might be interested in writing about one of those early, really juicy still life paintings. And I think you enjoyed seeing the Zurich oh, God, painting today. Yeah. yeah. But um, I now realize that, that your still life is coming from a very different place. And, um, yeah. But um, anyway, that, that'll be for our next catalog, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> right, right, right. From your mouth to Prince's ears. Right. <laughs> so, Julia, you had a question, I thought, about um, one of our, our curatorial choices here. Or, or were you, do you want to yeah. take this someplace yeah. else right I, now? No, I think, I think this is a good moment. Um, and a part of me just wants to jump ahead to the plate and talk about the plate, but we'll, we'll stay here for a moment. So we can see the plate. I mean, it's we all, can see the plate yeah. on the right side. So let's let's do. We, we can we can go fast through this. Mm -hmm. Part of me wants to. I want to hop over this part. May we? Yeah, yeah, can yeah. We? Sure. We'll, we may come back to it, um, and that is to get to. The Here. plate, where the plate is, um, we get, I'm, I'm not behaving 
to the conversation, but I want to get to this image on the right where <laughs> the um, where the wall behind the plate is not unlike the cotton or the clouds hugging the edge of the Horace Pippin house. There's so, so much relief yeah, in that, there's, right? There's a tactility um, that it, while you were talking about Pippin, I was thinking, oh, the house, the plate, the paint, um, and the, um, the argument between, uh, between illusion and um, the sort of willing the material to do some meta version of its subject. So um, now we can go back to. I did. Uh, let's just. Really, we're going to do the whole the whole thing now? <laughs> okay, that's fine. I'm happy to talk about. Let it. me look at the clock. <laughs> yeah. Oh. I let's. Well, we'll okay. I'll, we can we can just very very quickly. I'll, I'm gonna, I'll yeah. do it as as fast as I possibly can, yeah. just to summarize and say, right, right. Julia made a brilliant observation that there's a wall, <laughs> where oh, yes, yeah. you know, about you know twelve inches of wall separates twenty years of Cezanne painting, and that you've got the bather on one side and the father on the, the other yes. side, and we can uh, we we could really you know talk for another. 20 minutes about this, this pairing and how they're functioning in the exhibition. But very briefly, there's a sense of Cezanne kind of um, reinscribing his pictures within other pictures. So for example, the, the sugar bowl pears and blue cup appear behind the large portrait of his father in um, the bather from the Museum of Modern Art from 1885. We sort of do a little almost a genealogy of where he comes from, um, first appearing in this bathers at rest scene from 1875, and then thinking about each of these bathers as kind of recurring figures or types. Um, but what landscape, sorry, what still life also allows us to do is, is think about domesticity and everyday life. And I know that, Julia, you've been really um, kind of attending to, to these works in particular, um, where there's a, a golden colored wallpaper with blue crosses on it Correct. from Cezanne's apartment in, in 1877. Right. And I'll just stop right there so you can talk about what you'd seen in them. Advance. Thank you for indulging. Um, teaching painting and looking at painting, um, if you were studying in Chicago, if you weren't a student at the School of the Art Institute, you still had access to the collection, and I sent so many individuals to look at the plate of apples. Not the basket, but the plate. <laughs> and for the reasons that, um, that I outlined earlier, which is that I, I um, understood and still believe that one of the major, um, the major gifts that Cezanne gives us with this painting is that argument that I summarized a few moments ago, which is he's confronting a tradition of illusion. That's the expectation. But he's, but he's making um, an argument in front of himself. He's willing it. He's actually willing the plate to be there so that it could hold the apples that he would will to be there as well. And, you know, later things become vaporous and the watercolors allow him to think differently and the, the surfaces open up. But the, the sheer argument of the tactility is so manifest in this painting that I, it seemed like an important one on many occasions uh, to bring to the attention of, of students. So it brought my own attention to this painting in that way. What this, um, what this exhibition has offered us is the, uh, the, the bringing together of these three canvases, which are all from this time period, painted um, from observation in the, in the apartment, as Caitlin said, with the wallpaper. And we can see in the center painting, the wallpaper is presented in a very clear, patterned way. And what we see in Madame Cezanne and in the Plate of Apples, is Cezanne's moving those 
um, that pattern around. He's shifting this, uh, des the indications of the wall and reacting, allowing the wall to react to the sitter, his wife, <clears throat> and the plate of apples. But somehow, that center still life, uh, everything's quite respectful and um, even-handed, maybe. Um, what I didn't see, this is another opportunity to just remark on what happens when a lot of work is brought together. For the first time, I'm really seeing Cezanne's work. Uh, and, and can I just, what, what, what do you mean by that? I mean, I've seen, a, I've seen many individual paintings here and from travel, um, but what the exhibition lays out for me is uh, the early, uh, especially the early paintings that are really rugged and um, stubborn and uh, subjects that are challenging for me. Uh, and it changed the way I see even a, um, the plate of apples that seems suddenly less stable than I ever thought it was. Um, there's, uh, there's a kind of, um, well, Luke Toyman's statement refers to a kind of violence that he sees in Cezanne's work. And I think that's what's also been sort of offered to me in this opportunity. What I also didn't see until the, the last couple of weeks is that I had absorbed the cross-like sign of the wallpaper just as much as I had absorbed the um, the edge of the plate and 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 what that meant what that meant um, to me as an argument. I mean, we even seen the wall crawl over the edge of the of the plate, and it was then that I realized I had absorbed that sign system of the wallpaper to such a degree that it became part of the basis for a sign system of marking um, movement and light within a set of 10 paintings based on the living rooms of the house that I um, fortunately live in in Chicago. On the left, a painting from the entry, which maybe brings us to the opportunity to talk about scale. That's mm -hmm. one to one. The living rooms are based on floor plans at a scale of one to seven. Um, and the code system is uh, generated from the indications of light or action across the floor plane. But here we have a detail from the red armchair from the plate of apples. <laughs> and it was only you know, in the last couple of weeks that I realized that I had been so imprinted by that sign that it had become uh, a, another kind of language to indicate light in my own work. Rodney, I know that the, the plate of apples has also meant a lot to you, or it's been one of the pictures that you, you've focused on. Yeah, I was tasked to go look at at, at, those, at those apples and also Susan the ones that my yeah. Susan Kraut sent me to, to check them out. Um, Let's go this way. We can just... And, and what was it that you that observed? Or well, I, I, I couldn't understand. Um, well, I couldn't understand how they were different than what I was doing because what I was doing was tilted, but I couldn't see the tilt. And I think that was, um, so it was really about looking. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and I think spending time looking at his work and some of his contemporaries, I was able to see the choices they were making and then see the non-choices that I was making that seemed like a choice. Does that mm -hmm. make any sense? The non-choices yeah. were In the choices. sense that I was kind of working out of habit, but not necessarily a knowingness. But it was out of like a, a kind of body memory and a, and a habit and a way of looking. And I had to kind of like relearn how to look or look at, learn how to look at what I was doing within a different kind of context. Mm -hmm. Or at least with a plurality of contexts. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And Caitlin, that's the way you also describe Cezanne. That he... One, he worked at giving up what was a normative, mm -hmm. yeah. a, a way of representation and um, found another way. Is that Yeah, is that I, think that's, yeah. I think that is fair to say. I mean, there's this uh, relatively 
famous quotation that you know Cezanne had a singular weakness, and that was being incapable of practicing any art of which he was not the sole creator. <laughs> so that's Maurice Denis, and that is, and he's it's it, he's so much himself. But I think um, he we do see. What's what's interesting to me, what's fascinating to me, is is the way that Cezanne becomes that that his works are critical of so many aspects of painting, mm -hmm. in his own time, of centuries before. But to what extent is he offering that critique, or is he simply offering the language to apply that critique for a subsequent generation? Um, and that's something that we could talk about a lot. But I, I love both of you have helped me understand the, the three-dimensionality of this work. And almost, Julia, when, as you were talking about sort of willing those apples into form, it's like an alchemy of oil paint, you know, like, whereas the picture that has always been um, so, I don't know, central to my understanding of the, the works that we have is this one. It's the, it's the basket of apples, a, a picture acquired in, in 1926. And I always think of, you know, the fact that this was on view so regularly early on. So many people have seen this and thought about, you know, why, why is this in a museum? This, this does not have good perspective. Those apples are about to fall out of the basket. You know, that table is not continuous. This, um, but it's also a, a fascinating and fantastic picture in, in my mind. And, you know, it's the work that we chose for, for the cover of our catalog, Right. you know. So when I'm looking up at the time, we've got about 10 minutes. Um, we're well, any questions that people have, we have, it looks like Miguel, we have two microphones that are here, or if there are not questions, we can continue our discussion for a little bit. But I'd love to, to hear some questions question. from the audience. I'll bet there's a question. Oh, mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that we we sure. I'm I'm happy to repeat that question, and then um, as other people have questions come to mind, we have some microphones here. But the the question is about the three apples in the the front, the foreground, outside of the plate. And um, your question is, can we help you see those? Um, gosh, I, I don't. I'm not sure that I can. I mean, there. It's, uh, the the thing that's the thing that is so startling about this work to me is the materiality of the decoration on the tablecloth, and the way that that's as physically present as the crosses in the wallpaper, uh, and the way that that sort of. I mean, you talked about them being smushed, so I think spatially suffocating. Sorry about the suffocating. It's it is a suffocating picture. I mean, this is, there are some works, and talk, going back to our conversation about finish and unfinished, and this is, this is over-finished. I mean, this is, every single square centimeter has been applied again, again, again. What, do you have thoughts on this, Julia? Why, why it's, uh, what's happening there? They are three. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, yeah. this, and this is early. I don't know. Uh, there are three, there are two crosses on the wall and a little, a tiny piece of one way over here on the right. I mean, there. I don't. I don't mean to s suggest that that's the, that's the system, but it's it is a visual incident, and and they are two of them seem especially protected. One of them less. Mm -hmm. um, what Caitlin, what you just pointed to is the decoration on the cloth, yeah. which is animated in a very different way and even could be seen as a kind of distorted reflection of the image on the mm -hmm. wall. So yeah. there's, um, there's that possibility. And another thing, this is just anecdotal, is when we look at a lot of the still lifes that have cloths in them, uh, often Cezanne will put apples on either side of um, kind of a fold of the cloth to help articulate the white area there. So maybe uh, those yeah. apples are helping to articulate the, the lip of the, right. the plate, but I don't know, that's a, that's a speculation. Right. So. Any other questions?
Is there someone oh, at a microphone? We, should we be passing the microphones around? Is that possible? Or I think if you if you have a question, would you mind going to the um, to the aisle where there's a, oh, a good, stand? Someone, there's a brave person. Thank you. I read somewhere that cobalt blue was significant to Cezanne. Could you comment on that? Cobalt blue, I don't know about that. Uh, ultramarine blue is really significant. Um, most of the, the drawing, sort of the linear elements of his paintings, both in watercolor and in oil, um, tend to be um, ultramarine. But I wish our, our conservation and science colleagues were here to, to speak to cobalt too. We do find that in his pictures. Um, but yeah, the, it's really the, the, um, the ultramarine. Let's see if we can find one that has some good use of that. We're not getting very, not getting very close up with them. Well, you know what, in the, um, the very first works we were talking about, sorry, I, well, I, actually in the skulls. In the skulls. Yeah, all, all of those contours. Almost um, all, of the, all of the contours are um, a, a blue line. Um, and the darkest areas, I think there's indigo that was a pigment that was added to some of the very darkest parts. Yeah. But blue line. Or Prussian blue, it, right? It, maybe it, Prussian yeah. blue. Um, in the section of the gallery of, of the exhibition that uh, emphasizes the watercolors, almost all of the contours have a, a, that dark line is carried by blue. Yeah. There's Next someone. question, maybe? I was just going to make a comment about the um, well, more than one composition, but looking at the dish with the apples or peaches and the three on the outside that we were talking about, it doesn't have to be that one in particular, but it seems to me whether he did it consciously or, or not, it, it makes your eye move. It adds movement mm -hmm. uh, right. to the picture. And I'll take away those three and really it's unbalanced. There's no point of interest. Your eye isn't moving. I think a lot has to do with composition. And uh, maybe he saw that something was missing. Um, it's like the one, the, the what was a sous bois. Uh, what a magnificent composition yeah. of the trees. Yeah. Your eye is moving. So I, I think a lot has to do with composition. As an artist, it may not be a conscious um, Design, it could be that that's the artistic sense, that, that for balance, for eye movement, for the vision. Um, that's all I want to say. Thank you. I have so, lots more to say, but I'm going to stop mm -hmm. there. Well, that's a wonderful comment. And in fact, the, the next slides that we would have spoken about are composition and all of the uh, interesting choices that Cezanne makes in, in creating a composition. But thank you. I have a question. As you guys put together the exhibition and had so many works to choose from, what were the themes that you utilized to create the exhibit? Um, that's a great question. So as Gloria and I and our colleagues at Tate were starting to think about this, you know, what does it mean to do a, a retrospective of an artist like Cezanne today? Um, we said we wanted to make it a, a focused full career retrospective. So really going from the 1860s to the end of his life in 1906, but to allow you to go across medium and across genre. So when you are in the exhibition galleries, we hope that there is a clear sense of um, bodies of work that are you know, naturally related to each other because they're either the same genre, because they were made at the same time or it's the same motif but then also allowing you to go um, across bodies of work because so much of Cezanne's practice is um, a translation of earlier works that he's made. So, um, I mean, in, it, when you go through the exhibition, and I don't think we came to this realization until very, very late in the game, the first third is sort of bodies of work that introduce you to the artist, this idea of aligning um, sight and touch his relationship to the Impressionist group, his family, his family, his family right, right. for sure, right. um, and this idea of kind of pieces of pictures reappearing in other pictures. Then the middle third of the exhibition is all still life, 
And then the last third is the most iconic subject. So Mont Saint Victoire, the Bay of Marseille from Estac, um, the skulls, the female bathers, um, and sort of seeing those together. So you go across the full career, but it's really, we, we were very precise in making groupings of, you know, like look at these two or three pictures together and trying to make it not totally overwhelming to see you know, 40 years of consistent production. I, I would add that one of the really important contributions you've given is that uh, it's not chronological so yeah. precisely that things from early and later are frequently sharing the wall and that's, that's emphasizing his interest in revisiting certain images and it's not only re repainting, a pa placing a painting within a painting, but rethinking a motif, or yeah. a subject. Um, yeah. yeah, I thought about repetition a lot. Yes, right. Like, it's, like, I really noticed the repetition. I mean, that's a big part of modernism, but like, but the way that it, the way that it reverberates through the hang, but also, mm -hmm. but through the work and then through the hang of the work and right. like how things are um, juxtaposed, that, that act. It's like you've installed it to make us think about the role of repetition in a way, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, really, com comparisons and sort of maybe why is Cezanne going back to, um, you know, the, the blue cloth still life again and again, right. or that particular vantage of Mont Saint Victoire, you know. Right. Um, right. But an another, another question. Hi, Rodney. Jeff Jansen from your post back class all those years ago. Wow. Nice right. to see you. Welcome back. Um, I, I haven't read your essay, but when it flashed up on the screen, um, I, the word bones jumped out at me, and I wondered if you would just talk about bones. I mean, it's surprising or pleasurable to know that Julia was writing about the skulls. It seems like a connection, but, um, and I have thoughts about what's going on in the painting having to do with bones, but take it away. Yeah, yeah well, I was just thinking about um, the fact that when this was painted, there were lots of French, uh, Colonial uh, colonial outposts, from the Congo to Vietnam to uh, uh, to other places throughout the world, and I was thinking about the context in which he's making these plein air paintings, and what's going on around, and like how is he thinking about um, the conditions of his of his contemporary living within the context of like the landscape that he's depicting, and and thinking about the relationship between um, uh, the materials he's using and the sites where some materials were probably being extracted. Mm -hmm. And so the bones underneath speaks to, well, the undergrowth, like what is underneath, um, uh, I guess, the context of the, like what is the context of this and what is underneath that? Like, the that, whole culture, yeah, right. is supporting and, this picture. Right, yeah. and, 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 and I think about that a lot with artwork. Um, you know, today we look at impressionists and a lot of, they're on mugs, they're on uh, calendars and people's offices and they're gorgeous, you know, from this lens. But at that time, it wasn't considered that. They ha it had a different kind of import, you know, um, Monet's works were in a front. But for me, they're some of the most, of that, of, of his contemporaries, some of the most conceptually driven and, and intriguing works because they do think of make me think about temporality and repetition and looking and those kinds of things. So the bones underneath it, is, 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 it just speaks to what's not, what's not there, but is there, yeah. yeah. So um, I see some folks leaving and the lights flickered. I, that might have been a sign to us that it's seven o'clock now and we should probably wrap this up. But thank you so much, Rodney and Julia for your thank incredible, you. thank you, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Incredible thank you.